Our scripture reading this morning is found in Philippians chapter number 2. Philippians chapter number 2. And there's a copy of our text in the handout this morning. If you have a copy of God's Word, would you stand with me for the reading of God's Word? Philippians chapter number 2. And we'll begin reading in verse number 5. Philippians 2, 5 says, Let this mind be in you, which was also in Christ Jesus, who, being in the form of God, thought it not robbery to be equal with God, but made himself of no reputation, and took upon him the form of a servant, and was made in the likeness of men. And being found in fashion as a man, he humbled himself, and became obedient unto death, even the death of the cross." Wherefore God also hath highly exalted him, and given him a name which is above every name, that at the name of Jesus every knee should bow, of things in heaven, and things in earth, and things under the earth, and that every tongue should confess that Jesus Christ is Lord, to the glory of God the Father. Wherefore, my beloved, as ye have always obeyed, not as in my presence only, but now much more in my absence, Work out your own salvation with fear and trembling. For it is God which worketh in you both to will and to do of his good pleasure. Let's pray. Our Heavenly Father, we thank you for your word this morning. We thank you for how our hearts have been encouraged uh, through song and now through the scripture in front of us. We pray that you would use this message to speak to our hearts in in a way that brings glory to you. And we pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. You can be seated. Maybe you're like me, and from time to time you see someone, and on the outside you're kind of evaluating, and you're wondering, what's gone on in this person's life? Maybe it's a, it's a very hard look. Maybe it's a, a, a person that's very disheveled, and sometimes you'll see folks, they've tattooed their own face. Sometimes you see folks that uh, look like there's anguish, and sometimes you'll see someone externally, and and you'll wonder, I wonder what's going on inside there. I wonder what they're thinking or what they've experienced in their life. Well, I can guarantee you from the Word of God that whatever is on the inside is eventually going to come to the outside. And over the next several weeks, we're going to be learning about living the Christian life from the inside out, the importance of having His Word and His Spirit guide the outward expression of our everyday life. This summer I saw some things that uh, looking at them outwardly just made me wonder what in the world is the DNA of that or what is the origin of that. Uh, I was uh, over at Santa Barbara not long ago and we went to the botanical garden and I I saw an object laying under a tree. I think we have a a picture of it and and I looked at it and I thought, well, look at that. Some little boy's ball must have bounced over here, you know, like a little soccer ball or something. I looked a little closer. It was a mushroom. And as I began to examine that, I thought, wow, I wonder what the, wonder what the DNA of that is. How do, you, how do you get that color and that shape? And, and you kind of stare and gaze at those types of things and try to understand its origins. And, and then a little bit later on, uh, we were able to uh, spend some time in Colorado, and as we were driving out there, you're going through the, the rugged northern Arizona desert and all the red rocks and, and the dryness, and, and we took a turn and went up by a place called Horseshoe Bend, and as we pulled in there, we saw from the inside of all of that red rock the flowing of the Colorado River, and I snapped this picture as a reminder of what God can do with a parched soul and how the Holy Spirit from within can bring life. But it's amazing to consider sometimes, even in nature, the origin. I saw some strawberries uh, this summer, and there was one in particular that just kind of caught my eye's attention. Just take a look at that strawberry. When When I saw that strawberry, my first thought is, do I want to eat that strawberry? I mean, what's inside of the strawberry to make it look that way? You kind, of, you kind of wonder how it became so different. And then there was a tree that had fallen down, and folks were kind of standing around it, and we were able to look a little closer and investigate, and, and sure enough, that tree had been eaten by some type of an insect from the inside out, and because of that, ultimately, it rotted and it fell. And that reminds us that sometimes we can know how to look good on Sundays, We know how to talk the talk around Christians. We're standing tall, 
But inside, if things aren't right, we could be headed for catastrophe. So over the next few weeks, we want to learn what does it mean to live an inside-out faith. You see, we are quickly coming to an era in world history where Christians will no longer be able to live simply off of outwardly imposed convictions or by the mimicking of the convictions of your church, your parents, or even your pastor. It's got to be something deeper than simply copying what we see other people do. The testing of your faith is going to require that you have the true inner working of God happening in your life if you're going to be able to stand as socialism is now coming, as threats to your faith is now coming, you're going to have to have the inner working of God in order to stand in this day in which we live. Now, another term for the inside-out life some people have used is the sanctified life. What does it mean to live a sanctified life? That life that is derived of the Holy Spirit and derived of the Word of God. Certainly, the Christian life is not merely about outward conformity or behaviorism. It is truly about the Holy Spirit of God working transformatively within you and within me. The manifestation of God so that people see Jesus in you and they see Jesus in me. You might remember a verse that speaks about that in Romans chapter 12 and verse 2. The Bible says, and be not conformed to this world, but be ye, what's the next word say? transformed by the renewing of your mind. And we've studied that word before. Transformed is the word metamorphosis. Uh, as a butterfly emerges from the cocoon and from the inside out, there's something beautiful seen. God wants your life to be a beautiful display of the work of His grace internally. He says, I want you to metamorphosize in this world. Now, I think of examples of this. I think of Christ's appearance on the Mount of Transfiguration. How that with resplendent glory and divine uh, essence, he made himself seen and known to his disciples on the Mount of Transfiguration. I want you to recognize as we begin this series that you are either being formed by this culture or you are being transformed by the God within you. Teenagers, you are either being formed by the culture, by the things they say and wear and do, or you are being transformed by the inner working of God within you. God wants to take each of our lives and renovate them for His glory. He wants to renew them for His glory. But how does that happen? How does someone do, as the Bible says this morning, how does someone work out their own salvation with fear and trembling? How do we come out of that cocoon and, and truly live for the glory of God? Well, this morning I want to lay a foundation for the messages we're going to see in the upcoming weeks, and, and I want to share with you the basis for the sanctified life, for living out the inner life of the Lord Jesus Christ. If you want to live the inside-out faith life, then you must first of all begin with an inward humbling before God. An inward humbling before God. Now, I want you to see in Philippians chapter 2 and verse 10, a wonderful verse. In fact, notice in verse 9, Wherefore God also hath highly exalted him, speaking of Jesus, and given him a name which is above every name, that at the name of Jesus every knee should bow of things in heaven and things in earth and things under the earth, and that every tongue should confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. Now God has highly exalted His Son, Jesus Christ. He has given Him a name that is above every name. And God is calling us as human beings to come to Jesus Christ and that every knee should bow. Now, sometimes we speak of that prophetically, like there's coming a day when every knee will bow, but God wants that day for you and for me to be today. He wants us to bow to Him in salvation, if you're not saved, and He wants the saved to bow to Him daily, humbly coming to Him as Lord. We bow and we confess, and we say, God, I can't renovate my life. Every time I try, I mess it up. I can't transform my life on my own uh, best laid plans. God, I need your divine help. 
Now, Isaiah 45 is where we find this verse originally. It says, I have sworn by myself the word has gone out of my mouth in righteousness and shall not return, that unto me every knee shall bow. We must come humbly in bowing to the Lord. We must be humbled by the truth of Christ. There must be in your heart and in your spiritual journey a carefulness not to become accustomed to the death, burial, and resurrection. The Bible says in 1 Peter 5, 5, God resists the proud, but he gives grace to the humble. Now think of the truth of Christ for just a moment. You see, this is what we find in Philippians 2, this passage concerning the deity and the, the presentation of Christ. Uh, some call it the kenosis passage, meaning that Jesus emptied himself of the prerogatives of his deity. He never stopped being God, but he laid aside his prerogatives and he became a man. He took the form of a man and he came down to this earth. And the Bible says in verse 7, he made himself of no reputation and took upon him the form of a servant and was made in the likeness of men. He came in that manger in human form. And when I think of this, and sometimes when I think of my own life, or I see the attitudes of Christian people sometimes, and especially the world that is lost all around us, when I think of what Jesus did and how we act sometimes, I think of this verse in Psalm 8 and verse 4. What is man that thou art mindful of him? That God's Son would come down to save me and to save you, I propose to you should be a very humbling thought in and of itself. What is man that thou art mindful of? Say, well, I know what I am. I've got this degree and that degree, and I can do this, and I've got that job, and I've got that job. No, the fact is that we are lowly sinners, unworthy of God's condescension to us. And we must humbly come before him if we will have his working through us. He came to us. He suffered for us. Look at verse 8. And being found in fashion as a man, he humbled himself and became obedient unto death, even the death of the cross. The Bible says in verse 10 of Hebrews chapter 2, For it became him for whom are all things and by whom are all things in bringing many sons unto glory to make the captain of their salvation perfect through sufferings. We need to be humbled by this truth. We should not forget this truth that Jesus Christ suffered for us. I have in my hand here this morning a crown of thorns that we brought back from the Holy Land. And our tour guide, he showed this to my wife. And, and she's, she's a Sunday school teacher. She was up at 5.30 this morning getting ready for the fourth grade girls. And, and she always wants an object lesson. She said, honey, I want to take that home. And so we wrapped it in some plastic and brought it back. These long thorns. The tour guide said... Uh, these would have gone into the brow of Jesus and no doubt into the very skull of Jesus and the blood came forth flowing down as a covering for our sin. And when I think about who I am and when I think about who Jesus is, it should humble me that he came down to pay the price for my sin. We must be humbled by the truth of Christ. And then secondly, we must be humbled by the position of Christ. This Christ, our Savior, notice in verse 11 what the Bible says, and that every tongue should confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. We confess that Jesus is Lord. He is Adonai. He is Kyrios. He is the creator and ruler of all people. Psalm 24, 1. The earth is the Lord's and the fullness thereof, the world and they that dwell in. He is the lawgiver. Exodus 20 and verse 2. I am the Lord thy God, which have brought thee out of the land of Egypt, out of the house of bondage. You see, uh, the cosmic authority of our Lord Jesus Christ is expressed in this passage really in a triadic phrase that he is Lord in heaven and on earth and he is Lord under the earth, verse number 10. In other words, he is Lord of all. And we must never forget that the eternal Lord of glory humbled himself to die for our sin. And we confess that he is Lord. Jesus is Lord. Would you say that with me this morning? Jesus is Lord. In a culture that wants many times to demand of families that, that the children belong to the, to the society and not to the family. There may be times when you have to say, I'm sorry, 
but Jesus is the Lord of our life and of this family. There may be other times in your life when your faith is challenged and you'll have to wrestle as the apostles of old when they said, we ought to obey God rather than men. They were recognizing the authority of Jesus Christ. In John chapter 20, Jesus, after he resurrected from the dead, he came uh, to Thomas and, and Thomas uh, saw him and he felt the Lord Jesus. And, and, and Thomas said to Jesus, my Lord and my God. And Jesus didn't say, don't call me God. Jesus received this worship because, ladies and gentlemen, despite what the cults say, despite what the Jehovah Witnesses say, Jesus is Lord and Jesus is God. Amen. And this is the cornerstone of our faith, that he is Lord God. We confess Jesus is Lord and we worship, we worship Jesus as Lord you see, we do not merely worship a babe in the manger or a sacrifice on the cross. We worship an exalted Lord at the right hand of God the Father. We do not have statuettes all around this building to worship a statue. We worship Him as Lord over all. And when we consider who He is and when we consider who we are, there should be an inward humbling. And the beginning of inside-out faith is when we're truly humble before God because we are never going to experience His working through us if there is pride in our life. And I can tell you something about pride that, that I've experienced, perhaps you've experienced, is that right when you think you don't have any, you normally do. And I want to challenge you this morning to come to the Lord every morning and say, Lord, you are Lord and you suffered for me and I am unworthy and I humbly ask you today to work through me to help me as I work out my own salvation with fear and trembling. We must have an inward humbling. Secondly, we must have an inward obedience. There must be an obedient spirit to the Lord each and every day. Notice in verse 12, Wherefore, my beloved, as ye have always obeyed, not as in my presence only, but now much more in my absence, work out your own salvation with fear and trembling. Now, the obedience of the Philippian church was, first of all, a consistent obedience. Listen to that phrase, as ye have always obeyed. How many of you have had a child that always obeyed? Anybody? I don't think so. <laughs> None of us have had a child that always obeyed. What an amazing statement about the Philippian church. They were a consistently obedient church. And I want to tell you a secret about their obedience. It wasn't just to rules, and it wasn't just to the apostle. Their obedience was directly related to a response that they had to Jesus Christ. Why? Because of the word in verse 12, wherefore. Their obedience was hinged to their understanding of who Jesus was, Lord, and what Jesus did, that he died on the cross for their sin. And so he became obedient unto death, even the death of the cross. This resolution of obedience was based uh, not on a mother, not on a father, not on a pastor. It was based on Jesus. And it is a wonderful day in your life when a wife can say, Lord, help me to submit to my husband, not because he is worthy, but because you are worthy. When a teenager can say, Lord, help me to obey at school, not because it's always fair, but because you are worthy of my testimony and of my living for you. And you see, this is what the Bible teaches. Wherefore? Because of what Jesus did. Then we obey. 2 Corinthians 5.14 For the love of Christ constraineth us, because we thus judge that if one died for all, then we're all dead. Now, I want you to say that phrase in verse 14. For the love of Christ constraineth us. Ready to begin? For the love... This is inside-out faith. I'm not, I'm not being obedient because coach says it is the love of Christ that causes me to have this tender spirit. It is my love for Jesus that propels me to pass a gospel track. It's not just that pastor encouraged us. It's because the Spirit encourages me. I'm living this life 
from the inside out. And thank God for pastors and teachers and parents who provide good direction. But there must be a coming of point of a day in the life of a teenager when they're not merely living for the outside constraints, but they're living from the inside constraining presence of the Holy Spirit of God. We must be constrained by Christ. And then we will continue in Christ. It says, as ye have always or at all times obeyed. Now listen to what Jesus said about this. He said in Luke 9, 23, If any man will come after me, let him deny himself and do what? Take up his cross cross when? Daily. Daily. If any man will come after me, let him deny himself and take up his cross daily. You see, friends, if we are going to live the inside out life of faith, it's not going to happen just with a Sunday morning religion. We must come to the Lord daily and say, Lord, I'm humbled by what you have done for me. Lord, help me to be obedient to you because you are Lord of my life. And I want to come to you humbly and obediently and ask that you would be glorified through my life today. I want to obey, not in the presence of believers only. Because the true test of a man's character is what he does when no one else is looking. So, Lord, I want to live for you, whether I'm with my Christian friends or not. And, Lord, I'm humbled by your love. And I want to be obedient to you as my Lord. And so I'm going to come to you daily. And I'm going to ask you, Lord, to work through me. I heard of an angry woman who sent her son to to the baker's shop. And she went back to the baker and she said, Look, I sent my son in here this morning for two pounds of chocolate cookies and Uh, When I weighed the bag when he got home, there was only one pound of chocolate cookies. You better check your scale. Well, the baker said, "Uh, ma'am, you left your son alone with two pounds of chocolate cookies? I suggest you weigh your son. Now, Paul said that whether he was with them or whether he was absent, they were obeying. This is the character that comes from the life of someone that is motivated by a love for Jesus Christ. This is the balance we try to find in Christian education. Sure, we want them to come on time. We don't want them to say bad words. We want them to have manners. All of those rules are necessary. We don't apologize. But somewhere on that journey, we want them to have character and manners, not because of the external, but because inside their heart, God is at work. And they're saying, Lord, I want to follow you, and I want to glorify you with my life by having the right attitude. And so we see that this inward obedience was a consistent obedience. Secondly, It was a cooperative obedience. Now, they're cooperating with God. Notice in verse 12, it says, Work out your own salvation with fear and trembling. The word work out means to fashion or render. It means God's going to give us the resources and he wants us to provide a beautiful testimony. This command goes back to the early part of Philippians where the Bible says in chapter 1 and verse 6, Being confident of this very thing, that he which hath begun a good work in you will perform it until the day of Jesus Christ. God says, I'm going to make this happen. Salvation, you see, begins with justification. When you're saved, you're justified. You're set apart unto a holy God. But the process of sanctification is a daily walk with the Lord. It's a daily acknowledgement of the Lord. And God says, I want you to work out your own salvation with fear and trembling. That doesn't mean that we're afraid of God. It means that we walk in the awe of God. So when someone says to a teenage boy, hey, get in this car, we're going to go do so and so, and and, and that young man in his spirit is convicted by God, that young man at that moment, because of his fear or his respect for God, is able to say no. You see, it's easy to say no when there's a greater yes burning inside. And when your yes is Jesus, and when you're in love with Jesus, and the love of Jesus is compelling you, and then the world starts to draw you and call you, you're able to say no to the world because this morning in your devotions you said yes to Jesus. You went to Jesus and you said, Lord, I'm humbled that you died and shed your blood for me at the cross. And Lord, today I want to obey you as the Lord of my life. And those boys in that car, they're not the Lord of my life. And that 
girlfriend is not the Lord of my life. And that computer game is not the Lord of my life. And Lord, help me to say yes to you and no to anything that displeases you. This is the cooperation of someone that is working out their own salvation. Suddenly, they begin to forgive others. Suddenly, they begin to serve others. Suddenly, they're turning from sin. It's all a part of conforming to the image of Jesus Christ. And so we see here that this matter of inward obedience, it is a matter of a consistent Christian life, a cooperative Christian life. And thirdly, it is a Christ-produced Christian life. Now, don't miss this this morning in verse 13. Notice, for it is God which worketh in you. Let's say that together. It is God which worketh in you. Now, I want my children to obey because I said, but how many of you would say, I want God to work in their heart? And I want God to work in my heart. For it is God that worketh in you from the inside out. This is God doing this. This is God bringing this change. It is God that worketh in you both to will and to do his good pleasure. In other words, God's going to give you the desire to serve, to witness, uh, to forgive, to love. And he's going to help you along the way of accomplishing this as well. And so we see it is Christ produced. Therefore, if any man be in Christ, he is a new creature. Old things are passed away. All things have become new. God regenerates us at salvation. He transforms us by his grace. And then he renews us day by day. Notice again there in verse 13, it says, He worketh in you. God is working in you. He's renewing you. He's helping you. Hebrews chapter 13 and verse 21 says, He is working in you that which is well-pleasing in his sight. And there's two primary ways that God works in us. And you know these ways. The first way that God works in us is by His Word. John 17, 17. Sanctify them through Thy truth. Thy Word is truth. The way to live the sanctified life is to stay in the Word. Yes, Sunday morning, Sunday night, Bible study. Of course these times. But every day, opening God's Word and being sanctified and letting Him work in you. Someone says, well, I don't always feel God working in me. No, if your Bible's collecting dust, you're not going to feel God working in you. But when this book is open and it's being preached and when you're reading it and praying over it, listen, God will work in you. And the second way that God works within us and that God brings us to obedience is through His Word, the Bible, and secondly, through His Spirit, the Holy Spirit. And the Holy Spirit of God will draw us and will help us to be obedient. Romans 15, 16 says that we are sanctified by the Holy Ghost. In every way, the Holy Spirit is involved in our sanctification in the inside-out life. Now, before we move along to the practical side of this message, I want you to notice the quote right there at the end of point two. Jesus has gone to prepare a place for us. How many of you are thankful for heaven this morning? I am. Jesus has gone to prepare a place for us, and the Holy Spirit has been sent to prepare us for that place. The Word of God and the Spirit of God are preparing us and working in us until God calls us home. And your heart and my heart should be, I want to be more and more like Jesus until the day God calls me home. And that, my friend, is inside-out living. That is sanctified living. It is a, a, a tremendous tragedy when someone is less and less faithful or less and less like Jesus toward the end of their life. But someone like Brother Michael Michael, who in these last few months witnessed to hundreds of people and passed out hundreds of gospel invitations and shared the truths that God was sharing with him is a testimony of someone who was living the sanctified life right up until the very end. Why? Because there was an inward humbling and there was an inward obedience to say, Lord, I'm here and I want to come before you daily. I want to take up my cross daily and I want to follow you as my Lord. So there must be an inward humbling. There must be an inward spirit of obedience. And then finally, there can be that outward working you can't have all of that going on inside without it bubbling forth so the world may see. Now notice here in verse 12. Wherefore, my beloved, as ye have always obeyed, not as in my presence only, but now much more in my absence, 
Work out your own salvation with fear and trembling. Let's say that phrase together. Ready to begin. Work out your own salvation with fear and trembling. If you, if you mark passages in your Bible, that's a good one to mark. It does not say work for your salvation. We don't work for our salvation. Jesus paid for our salvation when he died on the cross. But he's speaking here about the internal sanctification manifesting itself externally. Warren Wiersbe says, the principle Paul laid down is this, God must work in us before he can work through us. Too many Christians obey God only because of pressure on the outside and not because of power on the inside. We want to be fruitful in every good work. And so he says, we are to work out our own salvation. Now, if you had perhaps a tree with a large honeycomb in that tree, and you take that honeycomb down from the tree, the honeycomb is already filled with honey. Your job is simply to get the honey out of the honeycomb. When God saved you, He gave you His Word. He gave you the Holy Spirit. And, and, and God has put His work in us, and He says, I've got what you need every day if you'll just take it out and use it. If you'll stay in my word and listen to my spirit, fellowship with my people, you'll have a reservoir of sweetness. You can bring out a life that is sweet and that is pleasant. You say, well, how do you do that, pastor? How do you practically work out a life from the inside out? What, I, I know that God put his spirit in me and God gives me teaching and preaching and, and he gives me his spirit, but how does, how does that cultivate and work itself out because I want people to see Jesus in me. I want my children to know that I'm a true man of God. I want my co-workers to know that I'm not a Christian in name only. I, I want to be true to the Lord. Well, let me give you some basic steps by way of reminder, just like we're going to give the kids when school starts tomorrow. Let's finish with some basic things. If you want to do a good workout of your spiritual life, First, you've got to read the Word of God every day. Desire the milk of the Word that you may grow thereby. The words of the Lord are pure words as silver tried in a furnace of fire, purified seven times. Thou shalt keep them, O Lord. Thou shalt preserve them from this generation forever. Thank God I'm preaching this morning from the preserved Word of God. And God has kept this for us. And God gives this to us so that we might continually grow and that we might live out His Word. Secondly, you can work out your salvation through prayer. Going to the Lord. Be careful for nothing but in everything by prayer and supplication. With thanksgiving, let your requests be made known to God. And spending time with the Lord and saying, Lord, I come to you with a humble spirit, with a heart to obey. God, give me power and strength to live today your life where I work and where I live. And thirdly, God will help you to witness for him. Philippians 1.14, and many of the brethren in the Lord, waxing confident by my bonds, are much more bold to speak the word without fear. And, and God will help you to work out that message and to tell others who Jesus is and what he means to you. And then, of course, the fellowship of the believers. Times like this and in our connection groups and ladies' fellowships and men's fellowships, these are so important that we would have fellowship one with another. And then finally, with a spirit of obedience to the Lord. Just coming to the Lord and saying, Lord, I want to obey you with my life. If ye keep my commandments, Jesus said, ye shall abide in my love, even as I have kept the Father's commandments and abide in his love. And so there must be an inward humbling before the Lord. There must be an inward obedience before the Lord. And then there can be an outward working. Look at that phrase in verse 13 as we close. For it is God which worketh in you. Let me ask you this question. Has God been working in you? Has God been stirring you from the inside out? Do you know that God is at work in your life? It is so important that we come to the Lord, that we open our heart to the Lord and say, Lord, I come humbly to thank you for what you did at the cross. I come obediently to say, your will be done in my life today because you are Lord. And then we go out. And when you go out in the world, you hear cursing and you see deceitfulness. And you, you, you see bad uh, things and you hear people that are bitter and angry and it begins to somewhat dull you a bit and discourage you. That's why we've got to go right back to the Lord and say, wow, Lord, what a day yesterday was. And, and, and God, it got a little discouraging because even some Christians were so negative. But Lord, what is man that thou art mindful of him? 
Thank you for loving us, even though we're so unworthy. Lord, help me to obey you today. Help me to say I'm sorry to my wife. Lord, help me to, help me to say I'm sorry to Joe at work. I should have, I should have stopped him when he said those things. And, and Lord, help me today to manifest your glory. I, I humbly come before you. I obediently come before you. And now, Lord, help me to take some of that sweet honeycomb and help me to make a difference in this world. I don't want to be like every other angry guy out there. Lord, I want people to sense that you're in my life. So, Lord, help me today to live from the inside out. May, may you be seen in me today. This is the theological foundation for sanctification. And we must recognize that it all begins with the gospel of Jesus Christ. It all begins with coming to him inwardly and obediently as the Lord of our life and saying, Lord, work out through me. May you be displayed through my life. May people see Jesus in me in the days ahead. And finally, if you've never come to Jesus Christ and confessed to him that you're a sinner and that you believe that he is the Savior and the Lord, then the beginning point of this dynamic transformation is when you receive Jesus Christ as your Savior. And if you've never received Jesus Christ as Savior, there's no better time to do that than on a rainy day in August in Southern California. Amen. You'll never forget this day to come and say, Jesus, I want to start that journey. I want you to come into my life so that I can live the rest of this life from the inside out.